I want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, over the past uh, several days, I guess uh, even beyond a week, we have all watched uh, the escalating violence uh, in the Middle East, uh, specifically uh, between Israel uh, and the terrorist organization Hamas. Uh, we have seen the devastation wrought by hundreds of rockets fired into civilian targets. Uh, and as that escalation has increased, so has rhetoric, both on social media and elsewhere, against the state of Israel, against people of uh, Jewish ethnicity, Jewish background, an increase in anti-Semitism, and just as importantly, you know, I grew up at a time, and I, I know this is still true today, even though we may forget it or some people choose to forget it, Israel is the only natural, true ally of the United States in a very, very volatile and dangerous part of the world. It is the only true, true democracy, and we have always stood with Israel. We were one of the uh, main countries involved with the creation of the State of Israel, and we should still stand with Israel today. So in that spirit, my conference, Senator Andrew Lanza, our deputy leader, introduced a resolution last week, or tried to introduce a resolution, in support of the nation of Israel condemning the acts of terror against our ally. But our resolution, which was co-sponsored by every member of our conference, was rejected by the Democratic majority. Now, the reason they gave us was that it dealt with foreign policy. It didn't deal with state business. And that's true. But today, we have a resolution celebrating Haitian Flag Day, which I would also think Haiti does not deal with domestic politics here. It, it's a foreign country. It would probably fall under the uh, status of foreign affairs or foreign policy. We've also had resolutions from the Democratic majority from everything from lifting the trade embargo on Cuba to condemning acts of terror in New Zealand and in support of the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of a Nuclear Weapon, just to name a few, which I would argue clearly deals with foreign policy. None of those resolutions were overly controversial, by the way, and all of them were not only accepted, but passed. The other interesting part of this is that if the Democrats wanted to pass this resolution, they could simply put one of their members' names on the resolution and submit it. But they didn't. They didn't because they don't believe in what the resolution stands for. It's really that simple. This is a black and white issue. Do you stand with Israel against terror for democracy? Do you stand with the right of Israel to exist or not? They, and I'll say this across both branches of the legislature, there's many members who were supported by or who are openly members of the Democratic Socialists of America. In their platform, it says you can't travel to Israel. They support the BDS movement. And that is a growing segment of the Democratic majorities in both houses. Whether that's the overarching reason why they refuse to accept this resolution, that's for them to explain. But I want to be clear, our conference, led by Senator Lanza, has no such hesitation about declaring our support and standing solidly with the people of Israel at this current time. At this time, I want to introduce our deputy leader and the sponsor of this resolution, Senator Andrew Lanza. It's good to see you all. Uh, first, let me thank our leader, Senator Ort. Uh, yes, this resolution has my name on it, uh, but this resolution is being brought forth by the entire Republican conference. and. Uh, I want to note that, in actuality, this resolution uh, was created by our leader, Senator Ort, after a conversation he and I had 
about what was happening in Israel and what was happening to Israel. Uh, Senator Ort, maybe because he once upon a time put on a uniform and put his life in harm's way to defend the freedom of America, felt so strongly about what was happening there to the free and democratic people of Israel uh, that after the meeting he said, we must do something. The Senate in the state of New York must stand for something. And he called me up and he said, Andrew, we're going to do a resolution. We're going to start there. So thank you, Leader Ort. Thank you, sir. Simple resolution. It represents everything most Americans say they believe. So why isn't this resolution across the hall being read on the floor of the New York State Senate? And the only reason I know of is that darkness hates light. Tyranny hates freedom. Uh, that has uh, been going on for as long as people have been running around the planet. Some might be thinking, what does that resolution say? That the New York State Legislature refuses to have it heard in the people's house. There must be something that the Republicans are hiding. I'm going to, I'm going to read portions of that resolution. It says, whereas on Tuesday, May 11, 2021, Palestinian terrorists used airstrikes on Israel targeting Israel's capital, Jerusalem. That is true. Whereas Israel is a strong ally of the United States and New York State stands with Israel, the attacks on May 11, 2021 were an attack on democracy. Will anyone come forward and say they don't support that? Israel continues to face the hostility and anti-Semitism, and frequently through the years, its statehood, the armed aggression of its neighbors. Whereas Israel continues to strive for peace and security and dignity for itself, its neighbors, and throughout the world in order to fulfill the prophecy of becoming a light unto the nations, and whereas the people of New York share an affinity with the people of Israel and view Israel as a strong and trusted ally, now therefore be it resolved that this legislative body pause in its deliberations to condemn the attacks on Israel and a reaffirm support and cooperation between the state of New York and Israel. We can't read that there. Who believes that as New Yorkers, that as Americans, we should not only be, in resolution, be reading resolutions like this on the floor of the New York State Senate, on the steps here in the Capitol, but in every hall across New York and America. If we don't stand for this, we don't stand for anything. We've lost our way. So what, it, what is it really about? Senator Ward spoke to it. The fact of the matter is, there are people who serve in the New York State Legislature who do not believe that this ought to be the policy of the State of New York, that we ought not stand with the people of Israel. Why do we care so much about that? Why do we believe that is so wrong and so dangerous to the people of this state and, yes, to our country? I think Ronald Reagan caught the essence of what it is that we're arguing here today when he said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on. If the mightiest free nation on earth can't stand, can't stand up and defend the few islands of freedom that exist around the world, well, then the light of freedom will be extinguished. And that's why we stand here together today, to make sure that that does not happen, that we must always stand up for and defend 
freedom wherever it shines, anywhere on earth. And especially, especially as Senator Ortiz said, when it comes to that one little beacon of freedom in a sea of tyranny that exists in the Middle East, which we know as Israel, especially when it comes to Israel. So we stand together as Republicans, as senators, to tell New Yorkers that we're going to stand for freedom wherever it is. You know, once upon a time, people say, why a resolution? What does that matter? They're only words. It's a piece of paper. So what if it's not read on the floor of the New York State Senate? You know, once upon a time, the mighty empire state, hailing from the greatest nation on earth, when New York spoke, people around the world listened. The voice of New York should matter and must matter. I know recently New York has experienced a little bout of laryngitis. I'm hoping that it passes. But it will only pass if we stand together to ensure that it does pass and that we once again stand up for the American way of life and for freedom and liberty. So I just want to thank sincerely Senator Ort for being insistent upon bringing this resolution. And while it's not being read there, we're going to continue to read it every place we go. It is now my privilege to introduce one of our newest members, a rising star in the state of New York, uh, someone who, is, uh, who gets it, who understands what, think, what it's all about, uh, and is doing this job as a New York State Senator for all the right reasons. Senator Martucci. Thank you so much. Senator Lanzan, thank you, Leader Ort, for allowing me to speak today. So uh, the leader and Senator Lanzan really laid this all out. Uh, so there's very little left to say. But the reality is, as hundreds of Hamas rockets fall on our ally Israel, Democrats here have chosen to play petty politics. This resolution, as Senator Lanzan just reviewed, is really very simple. And it's the absolute least we can do for our allies in Israel showing them support in this tremendously dark time. So the real question that, that's left is why? Why won't this resolution be heard on the floor? And you heard my colleagues talk about this. You know, you'll, you will hear uh, the Democrat majority say that it's procedural, that they don't take up resolutions on foreign matters, and Senator Ort uh, clearly demonstrated to us that they do. Well, the truth is that there are members of the Democratic Conference right here in the State Senate that, like Ilian Omar and AOC and the squad in Congress, somehow believe that these terrorist attacks are justified and that somehow Israel's getting what it deserves. Let me be clear. Let me be 100% clear. As Senator Ort said, there are not two sides in this conflict. This is a black and white issue. Either you stand with Israel or you do not. There's no other nuance. There's no other philosophical conversation. There's no other discussion in the matter right now. I pose you this question. Can anybody here who's been here a long time, I've only been here 150 days, like Senator Lanza said, but is anybody, can anybody imagine who's been here a long time that 10 years ago, the Democratic Conference would have stopped a resolution like this? That should answer your question right there. This is new, and it, and it points to the changing demographic of that conference. This situation just shows you how out of touch the conference is with things that matter to regular New Yorkers' constituents like my constituents and the constituents of the folks who stand behind me today. Folks in my district support Israel, and they expect the United States to stand with its allies. That's exactly the sort of common sense sentiment that this resolution would have brought to the floor of the Senate today. It really is unbelievable to me and unbelievable to the senators who stand behind me that the majority's leadership refuses to bring this resolution to the floor. It's shameful, and it really does, uh, it, it really does, as Senator Lanza said, undermine the leadership that this state, the state of New York, should be taking at this time. Some may see this action by the Senate majority as a simple, uh, a simple sidestep, but blocking this vote and resolution here today clearly and exactly defines where they stand. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Senator Martucci. I want to thank my colleagues who are here today. I want to thank Senator Lanza for introducing the resolution, Senator Martucci for his words. Uh, just to close, again, 
th this is a few years ago, this resolution would have sailed through. Today, in the middle of an, of an escalating conflict, we're passing a resolution about Haitian Flag Day. Where is this resolution condemning the violence and standing with our neighbor and our ally, Israel? Where is the moral leadership and the moral clarity? It's lacking. It's not there. This wasn't a procedural objection. Clearly, they have no objection to introducing uh, resolutions that deal with other nations, foreign policy issues. They don't believe in the wording of this resolution. They don't support this resolution. And that's why it's not on the floor. But we do. And I think it's imperative that we continue to talk about supporting Israel, especially uh, as the violence over there escalates. Uh, and potentially, by the way, in, you know, could draw in United States soldiers. This is an ally of ours. And this could you know, ultimately grow uh, as a conflict, which is why the President of the United States is probably on an hourly phone conversation with Benjamin Netanyahu. This does have implications probably for New York National Guard members. So I would even argue it's less of a foreign policy issue than they think, because there are, could be members serving in uniform today here in New York, like I once did, who find themselves someplace else in the world because of what goes on someplace else in the world. And with that, certainly take, uh, we'll do on topic questions first, and then we'll move to off topic. You know, Dan, so no, th this resolution is talking about standing with, supporting Israel. Just this current. Yes, just who we're, right, we're not, we're not weighing in, doing a white paper. I mean, I get your question, but we're not doing a long foreign policy response here. That is for people at the State Department. That is for people uh, who, that is their job. And that's also, by the way, for the leaders of Palestine and Israel to work out. Um, I think it's important at this current moment when we've had rockets, this started with rockets launched by Hamas at civilian targets, plain and simple. That was how, that's how we got here today. And that's what this resolution is condemning and we're standing in support of the Israeli people. Okay, we will move to off topic. I can only, I can only presume. <laughs> You're right. Well, um, we continue certainly to publicly, Karen, advocate for the reopening of not only the state. I think it's ironic, and maybe is a uh, tells you what even uh, the governor and others think of the state capitol when they're announcing the major reopening of New York, but not the New York State Capitol. <laughs> Um, so you can read that, I guess, one of two ways. But the reality is this should be part of any reopening. We have barricades and fences that have nothing to do with COVID and, and to my knowledge, have no continuing reason to still be in, in place. Um, there are some very brave and professional uh, men and women and state troopers and other offices here that protect this building. They have protected it as long as I've been here without barricades without fencing. Um, and I think when we're talking about reopening, it is very important that people see, I mean, we're, we're saying kids can go back to school. We're saying people can go to sporting events, but you can't come to your own state capital. The optics of that to me are, are lazy, terrible, dangerous. You pick any adjective you want. Uh, but the capital should be reopened. Um, and it can be reopened safely. I'm not saying throw the doors open and just let everybody in. Uh, but we have security professionals. There's protocols in place, you see. You know, we're all, uh, we've been exercising those protocols for the last six months. Uh, but I believe we can do that safely. And I think when we talk about reopening the state, how could we, how could we leave out the people's house? Well, why do you think they could probably keep you guys out. They'd, they'd probably do that too. But, um, <laughs> Uh, yes, I think you're, you're probably onto something, Karen, and you know, is that uh, these decisions are much easier without protesters here. Um, I mean, many of the folks, I'll tell you, I'm very honest with you, in my time here, 
Most of the people that would come here, that you'd see littered around the hallways, they weren't from Rob Ort's district, they were from the city, they were from some of my colleagues' districts. They're their constituents. Uh, I would think they would want them up here, or at least welcome them, um, and I certainly do, even, even if they're not my constituents. They are New Yorkers, they are welcome to be here, they should be here. Um, government affairs folks should be here. Um, and I know there's only a few weeks left, but I think even symbolically to say we're reopening the, the Capitol, there's gonna be a massive amount of legislation passed over the next four weeks, no doubt, that impacts the lives of millions of people. But those same people really aren't welcome here. Uh, I guess, I mean, you look at, we're reopening everything and you look at the Capitol, it looks, looks like we're, you know, looks like we're under threat of attack. Uh, and I just, again, I don't know that that is true. I, I have no information that backs that up. I think we can reopen safely. Um, and I think we should, we should lead by example and tell the folks, New York is reopening, your government's reopening, we've been here, but the Capitol's reopening to you. For Senator Morello, this is not a hot-button issue, but it's something <laughs> I'd like to know about nonetheless. Sure. Are you familiar with the proposal for making uh, no alcohol permanent in New York? <clears throat> Well, first of all, let me say that uh, a lot of other states uh, have this already. Um, secondly, this was a lifeline for the hospitality industry uh, to have the ability to have alcohol to go. And I find it ironic and interesting that one of the things I called for in the legalization of recreational marijuana was to follow the same rules as alcohol, and that would include not allowing people to essentially have a quote-unquote open container. That was not included. So you can walk down the street uh, with uh, you know, smoking a joint or, or chewing on some, uh, uh, some marijuana want a gummy bears, but you can't have a beer. So it's at very least, uh, you know, hypocritical, especially in light of the fact that they just did this. I think we should extend that. I think that the hospitality industry was probably the most injured, and uh, we had roughly 20% of New York restaurants close, most of which will never reopen. So anything we can do to throw them another, another lifeline, we should. Because what do we do so far? Well, we've doubled and tripled the cost of unemployment insurance. Uh, we've told them that uh, you can reopen, but only at certain capacities, even though you can walk into a Walmart and be shoulder to shoulder, and nobody's stopping you. We've intentionally, in my opinion, kept this industry down. And if we can throw them a little lifeline, we should. Several, a few, <laughs> a few. Uh, so uh, uh, most of them are seasonal operations uh, in a place called Sunset Bay. We have a place called Cabana Sam's, the Sunset Bay Beach Club. We operate a privately owned but public access uh, beach on Lake Erie. Um, and uh, we also have an Italian restaurant uh, called Villaggio Italiano. We have a a shirt shop, a deli, an ice cream stand, a marina shop, so we have a few places. So how do you, as a business owner, not necessarily a legislator, feel about the idea of getting rid of capacity restrictions but still requiring social distancing? Well, I don't think it makes any sense, first of all. Look, look, the bottom line is we have to reopen. New York State is at the very bottom when it comes to the economic recovery in the, in the nation. We have the, uh, the highest unemployment rate in the continental United States, number two, by the way, in, in the nation, only behind Hawaii, last I saw. Yet, I don't know a single business owner, including this one, that isn't desperate to hire people. You have restaurateurs that are being closed on the weekends because they don't have enough people. So uh, again, this is the whole idea of, of these continuous restrictions when other states are reopening is harming us, especially in my district, which uh, borders Pennsylvania. I mean, I've got a 100 plus mile border with Pennsylvania, where literally people can just chump across the border in five minutes and be in a state that has less restrictions than New York. So this is about our economic recovery and the lack thereof here in New York. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, some things don't get better with digestion, uh, and that's definitely, <laughs> that's definitely the book deal. Um, uh. Look at, now we know the dollar amount, right? We know the actual dollar amount, which I, I, I always think matters. But we also know that, uh, as someone, uh, one of my colleagues put it this morning, if someone buys me a $16 sandwich, that's a violation of J. Cope laws, Jake, uh, ethics law. But a $5 million book deal, no problem. At the very least, the average New Yorker can see the ridiculousness of that statement. No one's doing anything or changing anything for $16.
But for $5 million, who knows? The point is, we don't know whether he had the right approval. That's questionable, and that's just as much of a Jacob issue as it is the governor's issue. Um, but I, would, I, I just keep coming back to the idea that there were 50 governors who were fighting the same pandemic across this country, but only one of them decided to write a self-congratulatory book in the middle of it. Only one made $5 million total off of a book deal. And if you look at that governor's numbers and the metrics, hardly, in my view, uh, the one to give leadership lessons. And we certainly know that today. So I just go back to uh, every penny of that should be donated to frontline workers, to families who lost loved ones in nursing homes. That's the right thing to do with that money, with uh, the proceeds from that book. I have little doubt. I, I'm not a pro I was never an attorney. I don't even pr uh, pretend to be one. Um, but I know some people uh, in this conference who are were prosecutors, and I have little doubt that the folks at the DOJ or the Attorney General's office, uh, particularly the DOJ because of their uh, focus of their investigation, would take great interest in how that deal was constructed, when that deal was constructed, um, who worked on the book, all those things, because you're talking about money going into the governor's pocket related to a book on his governmental duties, well above what the normal outside income uh, uh, limits and stuff are. So uh, no question. I'm sure they've been looking at this and been aware of this long before we have been. So we do not have an independent body as far as we are concerned, but they really need to do this. You know, I'm sure you saw the governor on uh, the first press conference the other day. I'm a mom, I have a son, but I'm going to have a daughter-in-law who I'm going to consider my daughter. I can't even imagine if that was her and he's laughing and joking about um, uncomfortable, you know. That was absolutely horrible, right? All of us women can just relate to how that, you know, it was like it was a joke. And these girls came forward, and how hard was it for them to come forward? Uh, I can't even imagine. So uh, they need to have this independent body, and it has to be independent. So we owe it to all of those young ladies and future young ladies. So. One more for Senator Marcucci. Uh, back in February, I think it was a conference call. You had mentioned Chris Morales investigates governors handling nursing homes, given his record of um, going after politicians. Any support partner for that over the past few months? Well, um, look, you know, I think that uh, I would certainly like to see more of an appetite from this legislature in looking into those issues because we stand here as a group um, and, uh, you know, if, if the majority were, uh, had the appetite to do so, you know, frankly, we could have been taking those steps. So here we stand months and months later without having taken action ourselves. And, you know, I know that everybody here has advocated for that. Uh, you know, look, I think that what we owe everyone in this state is, is a, a, a full investigation into what's happened. And, you know, when I called for an independent process prosecutor early on, uh, I think that would have been an appropriate step. I think an appropriate step would have been this legislature uh, exercising its authority in terms of conducting an investigation, but I think we've seen many, many missteps uh, since, since my initial call. So, uh, you know, I think we still stand here today uh, as a conference ready to investigate this matter. Again, I think that it's, it's long overdue, and um, we all certainly await the multiple parallel investigations that are happening now. It seems like each day we turn around and we hear about a, a new investigation or or uh, a new authority expanding the scope of their investigation. Uh, but again, I think what I would emphasize is certainly as a legislature, we had an opportunity to act and we simply have not. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I oh. have one Yeah, look, at, uh, we're gonna, uh, we haven't had the conference today yet, or I had the chance to discuss it. I mean, I think we've complied this whole time with the, the majority's rules um, and the, the governor's rules and everything. Uh, but we're, you know, we're, we're cognizant that the CDC has the new guidance. Um, there's rules for when you're on the Senate floor, uh, but that doesn't extend 
to when you're not on the Senate floor or when you're outside. And so, you know, um, uh, I'm going to respect all my members' personal uh, health information, but we will comply. Uh, we got a couple more weeks to get through. Um, mask or no mask, this conference, I think, has been a very clear and loud voice this session. That will not change. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll go through this session and look forward to the grand reopening, which includes hopefully the state capitol at some point. And when we get back here next session, uh, I hope it looks a lot like past sessions. Yes, I'm, I'm going to go. So I'm going I'm to, I have to depart. Yeah, just, just real quick. Very quickly, I, I believe one of the many missteps in this whole pandemic is just occurred. So the governor made an announcement that we were going to go follow the CDC guidelines finally uh, with no masks, but really didn't give specifics. He, he gave out many executive orders, getting into the minutia, but not this. My office, and I'm sure my colleagues are too, we're getting barrage from phone calls from businesses. What do we do? I have five employees and four are vaccinated, one's not, and they're working close together. The governor needs to issue serious, specific guidelines to tell New York business people what they need to do. 